Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today we start the saddest Parsha of the year, Parsha Shalach. Parsha Shalach, the story of the spies and the terrible uh, result of that story. And um, these Parshas all go together. Last week's Parsha, the whole book of Amidbar, it's one straight idea. But especially last week's Parsha, Baloscha, this week's Parsha, next week's Parsha, I'm trying to thematically link the three, although each one has its own message. But if you recall last week, that uh, there were a number of events that the Jews just spiraled down from running away from Harsinai, from uh, being grumpy over their travelings, from lusting for uh, meat, quail instead of the man. We talked a lot last week about bitachon, that even though you can believe in Hashem, there's another element called bitachon, trusting Hashem. And that was last week's message. So we want to continue this idea, and it's sort of almost like, I usually don't do this, but we're going to start with the answer and then work ourselves back to the question <laughs> and then figure out what the answer really means. So we mentioned last week that the Jewish people, after realizing they made so many mistakes, remember their, their problem of bitachon was they, they thought they knew better what was good for themselves than Hashem. And they wanted greater challenges. You can take that chair. Uh, they thought they wanted greater challenges, and they failed. And once they failed, now they had the, the charge of going to Eretz Yisrael. And then they felt they weren't worthy, as we said last week. Either it wasn't good enough or it's too good, as we said last week. So now we're going to start with the words of the Shei Mishmuel. This whole shir is basically the Shei Mishmuel, the great Hasidic master, the Sakachova Rebbe. And um, he, he starts with, with, the, with the whole point of the Parsha. And let's just read what he says, just a little bit of what he says. He says, when God said they have to go to Eretz Yisrael, he says they found themselves and the entire community still not worthy for this. They said, we're not worthy to go into Eretz Yisrael. Perhaps their previous sins of the Mishonanim and Kivrus Tiber were in front of their eyes. They still remember how poorly they failed in last week's Parsha. They were not as spiritually great as they thought that they were. This sin stood before them also for the inheritance of the land. And therefore they said, we're not worthy to go into the land of Israel. They knew that Hashem loves to deal justly and would not ignore their sins. They would therefore find themselves in a great danger. They didn't want to go into the land of Israel because they knew they weren't worthy. And if they go in, they know that they will be punished. You can't go in, you can't live in Eretz Yisrael if you're not on a pretty high level. They knew that. And, and, and after committing two gross violations in last week's Parsha, they said, how are we going to be able to go into the land of Israel? We're going to need miracles. We're not worthy of miracles. That was the attitude they had coming into this week's Parsha. Is everybody on side with that? Okay, we, we, all, we all got that? Anybody have a question on that idea? Now look what the Shei Mishul adds. He says their calculations were correct. They were absolutely correct. They did not deserve to go into Eretz Yisrael. Okay? And, in, and this indeed was their sin. For they should have cast their souls and trust Hashem. They should have trusted that only good would come from a directive of Hashem, even if it was against their logic. Shem Yishmuel is saying that even though your analysis is on target, there is still a way to correct the situation. And that is by putting your trust in Hashem. And if they would have trusted Hashem, let's continue, this was their great test to subjugate their essence and cast away all their thoughts and calculations. Now this next line we're going to read is a very hard line to accept. 
had they done so, then certainly that trust in Hashem would have been a great merit for them, which would have enabled them to defeat the Canaanites. Without this merit, they would not be worthy, but the merit of trust would have made them worthy to be found deservant in justice. So what the Shem Yishmuel is saying is that the Jewish people look, took a look at themselves and they said, we are not a people holy enough to live in the land of Israel. We know it. We've seen our mistakes. We're not going to fool ourselves. And their anal analysis was spot on. Still yet, Hashem said, go. So now they say, well, how can we go? Hashem said, just go. And if they would have gone, then they would have been worthy. worthy. Which is kind of a weird paradox. You're not worthy, so you shouldn't go. Hashem says go, then you go. But the point being, the Shem is saying that the act of trust isn't merely a blind process, but it actually, and this is, a, this is a part that people have a big problem with. The biggest problem of anyone's spiritual growth is, is right in the beginning of the class here. If you are able to trust Hashem when your, yourself doesn't believe it, so you actually create a quantum leap of growth within yourself. And by taking that, making that quantum leap that makes the person able now to deal spiritually with that challenging situation that up to this point this person was not able to deal with. This does not work in a clinical lab. This does not look, work in, in a secular world. It only works with a Jew who has a hole in the all right, so that, that that's what you gotta. That's what you gotta. This is this is the the whole point of, of Parsha Shlach, that even though you don't, you're not on a, a high enough spiritual level, you can get there. How do you get there? You get there by taking biting the bullet, and by saying, you know what? If Hashem thinks it's the right thing to do, then it's the right thing to do. And the act of now accepting that and going through that motion makes you a much stronger and spiritual person, gives you the ability, you bring within yourself higher levels of connectivity and trust in Hashem. That brings the merit and the ability to, to deal with the situation and to succeed in that situation. That's what the Shem Yishmuel says. Okay. So, so their challenge really was to let go of the self-analysis and to provisionally trust in Hashem and move into the land and then come to realize that the willingness to move into the land is precisely what made the land appropriate for them. Okay, does everybody understand what, I, what was just said or do you have any questions? Because this, this is the whole premise of the class. Usually it takes me an hour to get to the premise. I'm starting at the premise, and then we're gonna we're gonna work on the on this premise. Okay. You have to have a very high um, level of talent. What was it say? Trust. A, 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 a spiritual, a, a very high spiritual level to have that level of trust. It, it's like if you don't have a spiritual level, you're saying you should still jump forward, but you you can't jump forward unless you have. Uh, you know, it's like a catch-22. Okay. All right. So you're expressing the frustration <laughs> that most people are express uh, are feeling in the room. <laughs> that, so how do you do it? Well, because there's a chick in the egg. And he's saying that, no, you got that. By doing it, it will create it. By doing it, it will create it. But you can't do it unless you have a certain spiritual level, you know, to... <laughs> Okay. Yeah, maybe in the desert when they witness. Okay, so the, so the question then becomes how does anybody ever move to the next spiritual level which they don't have? Right? All right, so we're going to try in the next hour to try to help us with this. This is very important because every Jew suffers from this. Every, every Jew suffers from the I'm okay where I'm at mentality. And therefore, um, sealing your fate to be doomed to stay on that same level for the rest of your life. Every Jew has, has, that, has that challenge. But there are some who seem to get beyond it. So now we got to understand, you know, 
um, what what is the you know like in other words it's all good in hindsight in hindsight if after you do it and after you see it's good and after you see that I became a big bigger spiritual giant you can look back and say wow that was amazing right but uh, and uh, but but if you're in but you're in front of it before you've jumped past that so where do you gain the strength realistically to move ahead when something glares you in the face and says you're not ready for it from where will this trust come from okay is this just going to be a blind trust well usually people aren't too good Jews aren't very good with blind faith they really aren't good with it they're too smart uh, for that it's okay for other religions but Jews are too clever to have blind faith you know or maybe there's a kind of a formula going on over here that we can relate to that would help us to avoid this kind of a mistake and you see people make this mistake all the time all the time you know and it's so it's so painful for for for, for a rabbi to watch it's painful to watch when he knows it's painful for a parent to watch when, when, when he knows we try and encourage a child to take that next step they don't want to take that next step and they always want to stay in their comfort zone so if we can perhaps understand a little bit of a framework then maybe it'll become a little bit easier okay so that that's the job for today this is not going to be an easy class if you thought this was going to be an easy class forget it this one you're going to have to you're going to have to cook a little bit okay so the shame is small first takes us on a path and he quotes a midrash a midrash in the beginning of the book of Bamidbor. When the Jewish people are counted, the expression that's used, it's a long midrash here on the second source. I don't have time to go through it all. But uh, if you look at the underlines, that those are the critical points. And it, in the beginning of the book of Bamidbor, it, it says, Hashem commands Moshe to se'u, raise the heads of the Jewish people to count them. The counting process of the Jews was called an expression of raising up their heads. While the tribe of Levi was not counted with the Jews, and the expression of lifting up their heads was not used, and for the tribe of Levi a different expression was used, the expression of pakod, which means number, number them. The tribe of Levi lift up their heads, count their heads as it were although we didn't count heads we counted the half shekel coin but there's a, a wording that's used as lift their heads while the Levites were counted separately which was number them so obviously that there's a message over here uh, you know uh, and and the Medrash says I'll tell you why because the word se'u has a double meaning lifting as we see when the two um, officers of Paro had dreams and Joseph interpreted them so one of them Rashi said uh, Yosef says and King Paro will lift your head up and will raise you back to your old position of glory and the other one he said and Paro will lift your head off your body when he hangs you so lifting has a double meaning lifting can be a lift that you're going to grow spiritually Lifting can also mean you're going to be, you're going to fall apart. And that could be a really terrible lift. Okay, so now, so now somehow the Medrus is saying, he want, Hashem wants the Jews to get that message. So what exactly is the message? What does that mean? The Medrus is very cryptic. So this is a message, in other, in other words, the Jews are being put on notice as we're starting the book of Midbar. You know, your head is going to get a lift. What kind of lift? We don't know the Levites don't need that message so it's very confusing what does that mean exactly we have to discuss so now we're going to move into a very very interesting issue uh, is it getting warm in the room or everybody comfortable we can, we can put the air conditioning on higher does anybody want it higher I'm getting mixed reviews alright let me know another 10 minutes let me know another 10 minutes see the problem is it's set for the shul which doesn't have anybody in the room this room's got about 25 people so this room is going to get warmer when anybody's really warm let me know and I'll just run out and in one second we'll make it cool okay so now a very important uh, discussion of spirituality is what is the crit critical medium of divine service the uh, is it what you feel about Judaism or what you do about Judaism and it seems to be a fundamental machlokas between the Chovah Savavos in the Sefer that Rebbeinu Bachaya wrote 
uh, circa the year 1000 and versus what the Zohar writes, which is much earlier. The Chovah Salavos addresses a very simple question. Why are the rewards, we know the ultimate reward for a Jew is the world to come, right? Why isn't it mentioned in the Torah? Why is not Olam Haba mentioned in the Torah? You look through the five books, there's no mention of going to heaven after you die. It's not there. And that's a very fundamental principle of Jewish belief. So what's going on over here? So uh, there's many answers to that question. And one answer he gives is very simple. He says, in a very simple way, he says, there's two types of work you do for Hashem. There's the work, the service of Hashem that you do with your body. That's obvious. And then there's what he calls, and that's the whole book he writes, is the chovos halvavos, the duties of the heart. It's what you're feeling about your feeling of your, of your beliefs in Hashem, the belief in the unity of Hashem, your feelings of love to Hashem, your feelings of reverence to Hashem. That nobody can see. That's totally in your heart. It's in your head. And those are two different services to God. You know, do you really feel a love for Hashem? Do you really feel a connection to Hashem? We, there's a lot of us sitting in the room. The people who feel this connection and the ones who don't, they look the same to me. That's all inside. Nobody sees it. On the other hand, then there's what we do. We can see who's giving tzedakah, who's not giving tzedakah, who's keeping Shabbos, not keeping Shabbos, who's talking Lashonar, who's not talking Lashonar. Those things that we can see. So he says a very simple rule. He says in the world, in simple terms, for the obvious, there are obvious rewards in the world of the obvious. And for the things that are less obvious, there are less obvious rewards in the world that is less obvious. Which means that for the things you do in this world, you get rewarded in this world. And that's what it says in Parshish B'chuk Kosai, if you do the things I want you to do, then I will bless you. And the, and, the, and the rewards are discussed in physical ways. If you give up and go to shul and do the mitzvahs that I want you to do, you'll see physical blessings. But if you really have this deep inside connection to God, there's no rate of exchange in this world for that. And you need a special place to enjoy the benefits of that. And that's in a place that's not so obvious either. Okay, that's the fundamental answer. So, like, where, where's all my rewards? So, therefore, the Torah, the Torah was written in a way that for the, what we perceive, based on our physical perceptions. You want to know beyond that? Go study the Zohar. Go study the mystical Torah. And, but if you want to know what's out there, okay, I want to live in this world and I want to have a happy, good life in this world. So that's your obvious way of understanding life. Well, God says, well, do the obvious mitzvahs and you'll be fine. But do them. And if you do them, then Hashem will reward you. But for the much uh, deeper, deeper rewards, you know, there's much a feeling of connectivity to Hashem, feeling closer to the source of the infinite reality of existence. That takes a much deeper work, and that's something that people don't see. So basically, what the Chovas Halvavis is saying is that where are things happening most within the Jew? Where is the most important battles to be played and fought? And where do you really determine what a Jew is all about? It's what's really in his heart and mind. That's the essence of his spirituality. Okay? So, but, but, and don't make a mistake. Oh, very good. The rabbi said the main thing is what's in my heart. I'm a Jew in my heart. I love God. I did that. Ah, but if you don't go to shul, and you don't give tzedakah, and you talk Lash and Hara, then you're fantasizing in your heart. The actions are necessary only as a proof as to what's really going on in your heart. Nobody could say, I'm a good Jew and I love God and not do what God tells them to do. I'm sorry. It's as silly as saying, I'm a wonderful spouse, I'm the best spouse in the world, and I never listen to what my spouse asks me to do. Now, would you accept that? Would you expect, accept that? I'm a wonderful husband, 
I don't make any money to support my family. Whenever I come in, I ignore my wife. I, I ignore the birthdays. I ignore any special events. I don't put her up on a pedestal. Uh, I rather would go bowling with the guys than be with my wife. But in my heart, I love her so much. What would you say about such a person? He's delusional. Right? Would you not agree? So why, why when it comes to your Judaism, we don't understand the same delusions? So, what does that mean? It means, of course, of course the main thing has got to be in your heart. But in your heart means in your heart. So how do I know it's in your heart? Because I could see what you're doing. I could see, you know, he, he really loves God. Look what he does. By what he does. Now, is it proof positive? No. Because maybe the person's doing it for other reasons. But one thing's for sure. If he isn't doing, then for sure he doesn't love God. Do you understand this point? And I know this offends many people because they want to be able to say they're good Jews in their, in their, in their heart when they know it's a bunch of um, illusions. Right? So what, what do you, you call me a bad Jew? I'm not calling you a bad Jew. You're, tell, you're letting everybody else know you're not a good Jew. What do you mean? I don't see anything you're doing. <laughs> the tar, the, being a Jew means there's 613 minutes. How many are you doing? It's plain and simple. <laughs> What does a good Jew mean? A Jew does what a Jew's supposed to do. No. So what's a Jew supposed to do? What God says. No. That's, that's, that's what it says in my Torah. Right? Now, some people would like to change the definition of Judaism. Okay. Then that's not Judaism. That's another religion. Okay. But that, that's the bottom line. Or, he could, or a person could say, you know what? I'm not such a good Jew. Okay. Then you're at least honest. Which is better. Because then maybe there's hope. Right? So that anyway, so what's the so Chavos says that the most important part is what's in here, and what you do outwardly. That's just the proof. That's so you so you're not delusional. Don't think you're delusional. No, it's real. You know, it's, how do we know it's real? Because you're doing all the mitzvahs. But the main thing is what's going on in here, and that's why the main rewards is what's going on in here, and the main reward is in the world to come. It's way beyond what you get over. That's why the Torah doesn't mention it. Okay, good. That's the Chavos Chavos. The Zohar, on the other hand, so that that which you saw was the um, all on the top, source three. I don't have time to say it all, but that's there. The Shemi Shmuel quotes the Zohar. We'll just look at the Zohar by four. The Zohar says that the thoughts of man do not affect the upper worlds. Only actions affect it. The main thing that moves <laughs> the upper worlds is actions. Zohar seems to contradict the Chovos Havos. Zohar says the role of a person's world is to fix and or build the worlds, in other words, the mystical spiritual worlds that are tied to this world, and that can only happen when you do things. The thing that moves the world is doing, and doing appears to be central. And thoughts of feelings, where do they play in? Well, it's in order for the doing to be a doing. In order for the doing to be a doing, you have to have some thought into it. You have to have a little feeling into it. Uh, to the degree you think about it and have concentration, your action will be a greater action. If you, if you shake a little of, like a robot, well, it does something. But if you shake a robot, uh, shake a little of, like a person who understands why he's shaking the little of, it accomplishes more. But it makes the action a stronger action. But the thought is subservient to the action. And really the main thing is the action. So it seems to be a major contradiction between these two sources to which the Shemi Shmuel comes to the rescue and makes peace between the two. And that's what he, he, he you just read along there. Shemi Shmuel says the following. We're talking about two different aspects of spiritual growth. The Chovas Alvavos is talking about the person's personal development. For you yourself, where will the individual gain the greatest personal development? It's what's going on in your heart and what's going on in your mind. And after all is said and done, we're only here for a short period of time. We disrobe our physical identity. Then we only deal with a spiritual identity. And that's in the soul. And the development of the soul comes from the heart and from the mind. At the end of the day, after 120 years, you take off the jacket, take off your dress, 
and your soul comes before Hashem, and Hashem says, what kind of soul you have will determine our eternal relationship with each other, and the soul was affected by what's going on in your heart, what's going on in your mind. And the actions were, were just tools of the heart and the mind. So in terms of yourself, the heart and the mind is key. Now, the Zohar, though, is focusing on that not only is a person committed to his own development, but also a person has to live with a tremendous sense of commitment for universal growth. It's not just you. There's a much bigger picture in the world. You are not the entire Jewish people. You're one part of a much bigger, grandiose plan that exists there. So, the, when we're talking about, and the words of the Zohar is building worlds, correcting worlds, making the totality of the Jewish people what, where it's supposed to be, then, you know, I, I have great feelings for the Jewish people doesn't cut it. We need to see real actions. Real actions affect other people and then make, as they say, the world go around. You could be the biggest tzaddik, really, and your heart is connected to Hashem in the most amazing way. And you love Hashem, you think Hashem all day long. But if I don't see any actions, right, then how are you able to build the rest of the Jewish people? And to build the world, we need the actions. Okay, you with me so far? We're okay? Everybody's happy? Yes? Okay. Either I'm doing an amazing job of explaining it, or I've lost everyone already. So I hope it's the former, not the latter. Okay, now we come to a major point now. Now that we have this, this basic framework. So what happens if a person, we're gonna say now, a person says, I'm into spirituality. And let's even say that the person like the Chovos Havovos, says, I'm into my feeling connecting to Hashem. I'm doing mitzvahs. I'm giving tzedakah, putting on tefillin, making challah on air of Shabbos. I'm doing it because I want to, inside, feel this connection to Hashem. So now the question is, there's a very subtle question here, but a major, major point. So why are you into this spirituality? Why are you into this spirituality? Why are you into this Judaism? Why are you doing these mitzvahs? Why are you working to develop a relationship with Hashem? And that sometimes people don't ask that question. It's a very scary question to ask. We're, we're going, we're going into, uh, you know, like Star Trek, going boldly to where no other man has gone before. We're going to get to a very. Uh, uh, don't please excuse me if, if this becomes a little painful. We're going into painful areas. We're going into areas that are very personal. Because now we're looking, okay, so, so let's, let's assume that, you know, anybody who's here to learn Torah on a Tuesday morning is, uh, has, a, has a certain degree of spirituality over it. There's a lot of other things one could do on a Tuesday morning, on a hot Tuesday morning. You can go to the beach. You can do a lot of much funner things, right? So you're in, so, so the question is, so, so like, so like why, why are you in the class today? And then why are you going to go and buy kosher food at Sobeys today? And why are you going to start preparing for Shabbos? And why are you going to, uh, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, give, give charity? And all these why are you into all this self-development? So that's a very tricky question. And the answer only comes when you get conflict between your own self-development and the development of the rest of the Jewish people when it comes into conflict. Let us say a, a certain situation comes your way and you feel, and, it's a, and it's, it will help other people, but you don't feel that it will necessarily be good for your own spiritual self-development. Is it the thing you do, or is it the thing you don't do? So let me give you an example from last week's Parsha to make it clear. Last week's Parsha in Baloscha, 
and it's also very they're all connected all, all the message comes in it says that God told Moshe to tell Aaron to light the menorah every day so the Torah says that Aaron did as he was told by Yas Aaron came Aaron did so so Rashi over there says oh the Torah saying the praises of Aaron to teach us that he did Melamech Loshina he didn't change what God said Hashem told do it, he did it. So all the commentators said, I don't understand. Oh, God told you do it, of course you do it. What kind of praise is that? Guy lights the menorah, he does what Hashem told him to do. So of course, that's a big praise. Do what Hashem told you to do. Malamech lo shina, to teach us he didn't change. So there's, so I, I, I already mentioned, there's like at least 15 answers to this question. And last year I was mentioned a number of them. But one of the great answers that the Hasidic masters say is you know, to be a tzaddik takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to be a tzaddik. Once a person's a tzaddik, his biggest challenge is to relate to people who aren't tzaddikim anymore. And you can imagine Aaron, he's a big tzaddik, he's lighting the menorah in, in, the, in the Mishkan, which is one of the most amazing things that can be done. Very few people on the planet can do it the spiritual feeling he got out of it must have been incredible. He was like way up there. And you know, this whole idea of, you know, like just being totally connected to God, it's like an amazing love affair with Hashem and his, and his reverence for Hashem. I mean, it's him and Hashem, he's in his own world, he's in the temple there, and it's, it's like in Olam Haba. It's amazing. So you figure, how easy would it be to get an appointment to speak to Aaron? Let's say you're a, you're a local Jew, a simple Jew, who's getting in big Sean Bice problems with his wife. And, you know, and we'll, and we'll say, let's say not the highest class Jews. Whatever, you know, very unsophisticated, uh, you know, grub, you know, and, and a base, crass, immature, fighting, you know, that can happen. Who was the address for this for 40 years? It was that great Aaron. Aaron said, what, there's a couple that has a problem? And, and it, it, you know, he said, well, what yeshiva did you go to? I didn't go to yeshiva. <laughs> oh, what base did you go to? I didn't go to base Yaakov. So you're really not going to, eh, we're not going to, I hate my husband. You know, so now I oh, can imagine what, what, you know, so now he's way up there, isn't he way up there? Now he's got to go way down. He's got to go way down. And, you know, it may take hours to deal with them, right? And to maybe get them to have a little bit more respect one for the other. Now, what could he have been doing than doing those three hours? He could have been enjoying a greater sense of closeness to God. In other words, in terms of his own personal development, he would have done a lot better to stay in the temple. <laughs> but there's a Jewish people out there. So he could have thought and said, you know, I, why am I going to waste my time with these people? That's taking away from my spiritual development. And the Torah says, Malame Shalo Shino. It teaches us that Aaron, he never changed. That he understood that there's only one basis, and here's the critical point. Why does Aaron want to be so close to Hashem? And here's the critical point that every person has to ask themselves and be very brutally honest. And saying, so I want to be close to Hashem because it's for my benefit and because I enjoy it, which indeed a person is allowed to. Or am I doing it because it's the will of Hashem? Now, if it's the will of Hashem, then everything I do is based on that. In other words, my connection to this whole spiritual game, this whole spiritual realm, where's the central focus of it? Is it me or is it God? Which tends to suggest a very interesting concept. That just like a person can be selfish in a material sense of the word, just like a person who has money, doesn't want to share with people, that's a selfish person. The person can be just as selfish in a spiritual sense of the word. 
and as holy and as religious as he thinks he is, he's very far away from it. He has just found a more sophistic way of being narcissistic. Do you hear? What's narcissism? It's caring about myself first. So, you know, and that can go in stages. When you're five years old, caring about yourself first means having a candy, right? Having a, a toy, right? When you're 10 years old, maybe the candies aren't so important now. Now it becomes, you know, good are you in sports? That becomes the narcissistic view. When you become a, a teen, an adolescent, it's, it's, you know, how do other people relate to you? And that's what you feed off of. And we move up the steps, you know. Then money, you know, how wealthy are you? That becomes the next narcissistic thing, etc., uh, etc. Et how are you viewed by the community as you get older? And then you might happen to slip into something called spirituality. And you might find out that Judaism provides you with the greatest sense of self-feeling and self-fulfillment. And wow, it's a great feeling to understand part of God's Torah. It's a great feeling to, uh, to, to seclude myself in the synagogue for a half an hour and commune with God. It's so refreshing. It's better than yoga. It's amazing. I feel, I feel alive. And the truth is, Judaism is supposed to provide all of that. But is, is that what it's all about? If it is, then you don't even realize that you're missing the whole point of the whole religion. The whole point of it is one thing. I want to do the will of God. It's not about me. It's about something bigger than me. It's something that's so much bigger than me. It's something that I'm part of. But, it, but it, God is way bigger than that. His aspirations for the world are way bigger than that. And am I more interested in what God wants or what I want? So where does it play itself out? It plays itself out when God gives you a directive to do something that you feel is inimical for your own spiritual development and will only help others. That is the litmus test. Are you prepared to what you think is a major sacrifice on your own pleasure? You could be sure Aaron felt a lot better lighting the menorah and sitting in the, you know, maybe it's hard because we're not on that level, but if you figure a guy is very spiritual, he would enjoy himself in that song. You know, have you ever tried to broker peace in a marriage? Have you tried to? Okay, let me tell you, it's extremely painful and not very rewarding because quite often, you know, both sides hate you because you're trying to make them see beyond themselves. You're trying to help them, but the way you're trying to help them is, but they don't want to move beyond their zone. They'd rather be upset with each other. They say, no, no, you've got to, you know, you, you, you have to say things like, do you perhaps have any faults? You know, and, 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 and you have to go through the pain and, 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 and it, it, it really, you know, and then maybe, 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 you know, you'll see some success. You know, at, at the very end. And maybe not. Sometimes you get involved and you're trying to help and, and it doesn't work out. But, it, you know, it, it's a lot easier. I'll tell you, it's a lot easier to take a sitter and say to Hillam, because I got no, I got no, I, it's right there. I'm getting it. It's getting happening. Sit down, put a piece of Gemara. Go to a poor person, give him some money, give him a meal. It's a lot easier. Sean Bias is like, it's more that, it's like when, it's, when you get into the real and you see what's going on and, and, and that, that one spouse is so disgustingly selfish and then was, you feel like you've just you know, gone into the mud. You feel like gone into the mud to hear all this stuff. Right? It's, 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 not, it's not a happy place to be. It's not that you, you, you kind of feel you got to go to the mikvah after you've counseled some people. You know, and it's, it's, everybody's got these issues, right? So, like a holy person, what am I doing over there? I don't belong over there. You know, let him go to social services. But, but, but the truth is, Hashem wants you to make peace. A husband and wife, if, the, if they're not at peace, the Shekhinah isn't there, and it's not good for the Jewish people. So, Aaron's greatness is Malamish Shloshina. For him, it wasn't any different. You know, you could have, you know, you could see the great people in the world, the great, great Gedom, the big, big rabbis, the big rabbis in Eretz Yisrael. 
you could see their writing response, a landmark response uh, about life and death issues. That's like highfalutin stuff. And then someone knocks on the door with a three-year-old little child and says, Rabbi, can you come and cut his hair? Can you come and give my child a blessing? And like, he would say, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm a busy and important man. But, but all of a sudden they put it down and also they put on a different face and they're talking to this three-year-old like a three-year-old and like, like a zady of this kid. And he, he pats him on the head and pinches his cheek and, and gives him a hug. Like, well, you're not the same guy who was writing that, that high school thing. You know, go, go try to see if a Harvard professor can, can go and teach a grade one class. Okay, that, that's what the great people, the great rabbis were able to, to, to be, deal with the most lofty ideas and they can walk out and deal with the most base things. That, that's that's Malam and Shloshina. That shows he, he wasn't there and didn't change. Right.